Hello, YouTube. Chrissyosity here. Excuse me. So, I assume that everyone is aware of the recent occurrences of statues being taken down, particularly involving statues of Confederates or slave-owning people. And there's a lot of videos on this topic already, and I will can definitely link some if you're interested, but I want to look at a different aspect of this question. One of the most common objections that we hear from people who want to keep the statues up is that this is about a celebration of culture, not slavery or white supremacy per se. The usual response to this is that you can't take those things out of this culture, and this is absolutely true. These were not fads. You know, these were foundational, omnipresent realities. But I think we can go, we can go a little bit deeper here. There are a lot of movies and popular books about the Civil War itself. And that's great. I'm not saying there shouldn't be. But as to the, the culture and the people that led up to this war and what was going on, not so much. I'm glad that we're not making Gone with the Wind or Song of the South anymore. Those were bad. <laughs> uh, but we haven't replaced them with anything. And so those are the images that still get to stand in some people's minds. So. This video will be a quick and dirty trip into the antebellum south. As usual for me, I will try to go with sources that are available online to make it easier for people to look up. In some cases, this isn't going to be possible, but I will link the books that I used and nothing that you can't find at a local library. And of course, I want people to look this stuff up. I don't want anybody to take my word for things. Look, from the very beginning of our nation, one of the thorniest issues was slavery, right? The slavery of African people brought over from their homes against their will in order to provide free physical labor to the colonial settlers, to be specific. This slavery stood in flagrant contradiction to the ideals of liberty that America was supposedly founded upon. And it was the economic backbone of the South in particular, with its mostly, most prominently cotton, but also tobacco and rice plantations, mostly cash crops. And they did bring in a lot of cash, right? They made some people very rich. <laughs> On the other hand, of course, it was a horrendous system of violent oppression that involved rape and the separation of children from their parents and harsh beatings and lives of forced labor from dawn to dusk. It was awful. I know that there will be people who will want to show up and say things like, oh, hardly anyone owned slaves. What are you talking about? It was nobody. They didn't even see them. You didn't, you could go south for years and not even know. Of course, it depends on where exactly in the South and what time period exactly you're talking about. But about a third of Southerners either owned slaves or lived in households that owned slaves. About a third were in the middle classes that had sprung up around this where they may not own the slaves themselves, but they were involved in some way. We're talking about bankers, merchants, sheriffs lawyers, you know, local politicians. We're talking about people who worked on the plantation as overseers or slave breakers. You know, so that's a, about another third, right? And then you have the yeoman farmers who their farms weren't necessarily big enough where they had slaves or they didn't necessarily have the money to have slaves, but they tended to side with the planter class and look up to them. And then we have very poor whites and 
those ones we'll be talking about a lot more later, so hang on for that. I will also briefly mention that anyone who would like to come in and talk about how we're judging people by the standards of our time, hey, I could do a whole video, if you wanted, about people from their time who judged them, you know? And they had some choice words sometimes. So it's, that's not really a concern here, but in any case, it's not our mission. My mission here is more to promote an understanding, and from there you can think whatever you want, I suppose. And finally, this video is about the antebellum South. Of course, that should not be taken to mean that I think that the North was not racist to white supremacist, or that Lincoln was a saint, or that the Union people just fought for slavery and had noble purposes and pure motives, or anything like that. None of that is true. Everybody knows that. Chill. Okay? I don't, I don't need the whataboutisms. We don't have time to talk about literally everything. This video is about the antebellum South. Okay, great. So, if we've gotten all of the usual objections out of the way, come on kids, get on your Sunday best. Let's go down south. <laughs> Southern culture was extremely stratified and hierarchies were rigidly maintained, whether you're talking about race gender, or class. At the top was this plantar class, who were incredibly wealthy, some of the wealthiest people in the country, and they owned massive amounts of land, sometimes hundreds or thousands of acres. They needed, of course, a lot of people to manage that land and work it, and therefore they owned a lot of slaves. This system was justified through white supremacism, uh, which held that white people were naturally superior to other races and Black and pretty much all non-white people were subhuman savages, but that in particular, black people were not suited to being free people. If anything, the whites who enslaved them were doing them a favor. It was gross. The plantation was both a home and a wealth-producing entity, a business of sorts, where power was held by the family patriarch, the father, and everyone was under his control and, at least in theory, his loving protection. And this absolute power, of course, was in reality a very corrupting thing and people were treated horribly. For instance, here's a reading from Journal of a Residence on a Georgia Plantation, written by Fanny Kemble, an English actress who married a wealthy plantation owner named Pierce Butler. When she went to visit his plantation after they were married, she was horrified as to what she found, and in diaries and letters to friends, she describes these things. Before closing this letter, I have a mind to transcribe to you the entries for today recorded in a sort of day book, where I put down, very succinctly, the number of people who visit me, their petitions and ailments, and also such special particulars concerning them as seem to me worth recording. You will see how miserable the physical condition of many of these poor creatures is, and their physical condition, it is insisted by those who uphold this evil system, is the only part of it which is prosperous, happy, and compares well with that of northern labourers. Judge from the details I now send you, and never forget, while reading them, that the people on this plantation are well off, and consider themselves well off in comparison with the slaves on some of the neighbouring communities. Fanny has had six children, all dead but one. She came to beg to have her work in the field lightened. Nanny has had three children, two of them are dead. She came to implore that the rule of sending them into the field three weeks after their confinement might be altered. Leah, Caesar's wife, has had six children. Three are dead. Sophie, Lewis's wife, came to beg for some old linen. She is suffering fearfully, has had ten children. Five of them are dead. The principal favour she asked was a piece of meat, which I gave her. Sally, Scipio's wife, has had two miscarriages and three children born, one of whom is dead. 
She came complaining of incessant pain and weakness in her back. This woman was a mulatto daughter of a slave called Sophie by a white man of the name of Walker who visited the plantation. Charlotte, Renty's wife, has had two miscarriages and was with child again. She was almost crippled with rheumatism and showed me a pair of poor swollen knees that made my heart ache. I have promised her a pair of flannel trousers, which I must forthwith set about making. Sarah, Stephen's wife, this woman's case and history were alike deplorable. She had had four miscarriages, had brought seven children into the world, five of whom were dead, and she was again with child. She complained of dreadful pains in the back and an internal tumour which swells with the exertion of working in the fields. Probably, I think she is ruptured. She told me she had once been mad and had run into the woods where she contrived to elude discovery for some time, but was at last tracked and brought back, when she was tied up by the arms and heavy logs fastened to her feet and was severely flogged. After this she contrived to escape again, and lived for some time skulking in the woods, and, she supposes, mad, for when she was taken again she was entirely naked. She subsequently recovered from this derangement, and seems now just like all the other poor creatures who come to me for help and pity. I suppose her constant childbearing and hard labour in the fields at the same time have produced the temporary insanity. I have had a most painful conversation with Mr. Butler, who has declined receiving any of the people's petitions through me. He says that bringing their complaints to me, and the sight of my credulous commiseration, only tend to make them discontented and idle, which brings renewed chastisement upon them, and so that, instead of really befriending them, I am only preparing more suffering for them whenever I leave the place, and they can no more cry to me for help. And this, of course, makes my intercourse with them dangerously suggestive of relations far different from anything they have ever known, and the overseer, a Mr. O, once almost hinted to me my existence was an element of danger to the institution. If I should go away, the human sympathy that I have felt for them will certainly never come near them again. The butlers eventually separated and divorced, as you would guess would happen where a slave owner and an abolitionist got together, right? And years later, the Civil War started. She published her journals and her letters from this time out of concern that England might side with the South, and she felt like if she exposed what things were really like down there, then that would help. And, you know, it did. Something that has to be kept in mind whenever you look at these histories is that you cannot take the things that slave owners said for granted. And we know this because we have the testimonies of the slaves themselves. You can go look up right now on YouTube you know, interviews that still exist from slaves from those periods. Um, we also know from their own journals and diaries, which often directly contradicted what they were saying in public was happening. So you might have someone who was out arguing against abolitionists and swearing up and down that slaves were very well treated and they weren't being beaten and, and harmed. And they were like part of the family. And of course they never went ahead and had children with slaves. That would be terrible and you know, all that stuff. And and they were what is called lying. <laughs> and we know this because of their own, their own words. You know, they would write in their private diaries exactly the opposite, like about the things that they were doing, the children that they were having, and it was gross. Yeah, really gross. This was a world of generational violence, of violence that was passed down from the older to the younger generation. John Nielsen was a Virginian who spoke in 1839 about his own coming of age in this system. He says, when he was a child, when his father beat their slaves, that he would cry and he would feel for the slave who was being inflicted with violence. He would feel almost as if he himself were being beaten and he would cry. 
and he would say, stop, stop. And his father, you have to stop that. You have to learn to do this yourself. And as John Nielsen grew up, he did learn how to do it. And he said in 1839 that he got to the point where he not only didn't cry, he could inflict a beating himself and not even feel it. Someone who can do that is going to cut off a whole world of feeling and make the larger system of obedience and submission into one of the great values, one of the great moral values. Obedience and submission are hallmarks of slavery. They're also hallmarks of patriarchy because the patriarch has people below him who owe him obedience and submission. People in his own family, his slaves, his poor relations, his wife, and then there's also Christianity in which pious people owe obedience and submission to God. So if you put together slavery, patriarchy, and evangelical Christianity, you've got a whole lot of violence and submission. It's been the work of many recent historians to demonstrate just how embedded violence was in the South. Their culture was predicated on the inherent violence of slavery, and violence and intimidation were needed to keep things under control. One way this was seen is in the enthusiasm for military schools for young men and boys. North Carolina was among the earliest of the southern states to initiate the study of the martial arts as a regular part of the course of study. Schools in South Carolina, Mississippi, and Alabama also showed interest in military education by the second quarter of the century. By the 1840s, a generation of young men had been trained in light infantry tactics, broadsword exercises, and cavalry evolutions on the plan of the West Point Seminary in schools based in the South. Most initiatives at established academic schools simply added to the ordinary branches of studies the science of camps and tactics, a modification that was found agreeable to the youth of the country. Military schools enjoyed excellent public relations in the South, engaging in activities designed to excite the interest of the populace. Cadets made frequent off-campus visits to communities to display their skills at drill and their attractive, if rather gaudy, uniforms by parading in the town square or on the county fairgrounds. An unbridled martial spirit was abroad by the 1850s, and most Southerners regarded their military schools as among their most valuable regional assets. Moreover, a wider usefulness was recognized in having a cadre of military personnel that could quickly respond to possible slave uprisings. Every time there was a slave uprising, and they did happen, the southern states would inevitably respond by more draconian and extreme measures. These laws mostly restricted black people, their movements, their ability to congregate in groups. It became illegal to teach a slave to read, but there were changes for white people as well. There were laws saying things like all men had to bring their firearms with them even to church, for instance, just in case. It was frequently repeated that if black people were ever freed, the South would be overrun and white people would be massacred. Aristocratic slave owners made especially sure to remind other classes that even though they themselves had the wealth and status to get away and move elsewhere that should this occur, the same could not be said about the middle and poorer white classes and they would have to bear the brunt of all this inevitable raping and killing. Huh. All right, part of walking around, always armed, and always with this threat of violence sort of living as a reality over your head, it meant that things would be much more likely to end in tragedy. So, for example, there were cases in both the North and the South of riots on universities, right? Apparently American tradition. But in the South... They were always carrying weapons, and so some professors got shot and murdered. But despite all this, these were people who were insistent that they were gentlemen of great honor and courage. One way that they sought to demonstrate this was through the ritual of the duel, which they engaged in not infrequently and at a time when it was going very much out of style everywhere else. The rules for this were laid down in the Code of Honor, or the Rules for the Government of Principles and Seconds in Dueling, by John Lydy Wilson in 1848. Wilson was previously a governor of South Carolina. 
I will link this document, which is available online, originally 22 pages of rules and regulations as to the behavior of the offending party, his chosen second, the offending party, the offended party and the offending party, uh, his second as well, and the process of notes and negotiations by the seconds and the rules for the duel itself should negotiations not achieve their aim of providing satisfaction. Let's take a moment to look at the beginning of this document as it's enlightening in many ways. To the public, the man who adds in any way to the sum of human happiness is strictly in the discharge of a moral duty. When Howard visited the victims of crime and licentiousness to reform their habits and ameliorate their condition, the question was never asked whether he had been guilty of lack excesses or not. The only question the philanthropist would propound should be, has the deed been done in the true spirit of Christian benevolence? Now, you may well be asking at this time, what the heck is he talking about, and what does this have to do with duels? The answer is, he's on about people not being all judgmental of him just because he wants to be writing rules for duels. Rules for duels. Ah. <laughs> He'll go on and on about this, uh, going back and forth between one contradictory statement after another with his main point, apparently, that he is beyond reproach, and if you say otherwise, well, that makes you the bad guy. It will be persisted in as long as a manly independence and a lofty personal pride in all that dignifies and ennobles the human character shall continue to exist. If a man be smote on one cheek in public and he turns the other, which is also smitten, and he offers no resistance, but blesses him that so despitefully used him, I am aware that he is in the exercise of great Christian forbearance, highly recommended and enjoined by many very good men, but utterly repugnant to those feelings which nature and education have implanted in the human character. If it was possible to enact laws so severe and impossible to be evaded as to enforce such rule of behavior, all that is honorable in the community would quit the country and inhabit the wilderness with the Indians. If such a course of conduct was infused by education into the minds of our youth, and it became praiseworthy and honorable to a man to submit to insult and indignity, then indeed the forbearance might be borne without disgrace. Those, therefore, who condemn all who do not denounce dueling in every case should establish schools where a passive submission to force would be the exercise of a commendable virtue. I have not the least doubt that if I had been educated in such a school and lived in such a society, I would have proved a very good member of it. But I much doubt if a seminary of learning was established where this Christian forbearance was inculcated and enforced, whether there would be many scholars. I would not wish to be understood to say that I do not desire to see dueling to cease to exist entirely in society. So I hope that clears everything up. And this went on for a while. That's just a taste. It, there are paragraphs. Ugh, anyway. I swear it was a relief when they got to the part where they shoot each other. <laughs> the reason I want to go through this is because this is the kind of reading that I at least encounter all the time when looking at this group of people. We'll talk about the lady version of this a bit later. Cognitive dissonance seems to enjoy a prominent place in their discourse and with an unhealthy dose of paranoia about what other people may have to say about them. I'm not saying that people today are super rational either, because of course they aren't, but these, these antebellum southerners had a real genius uh, <laughs> for holding a lot of incompatible positions at once. For instance, I'm a wonderful Christian person who happens to own people. 
And this is a habit of mind that becomes really pronounced in their writings and actions, in my humble opinion. For instance, dueling. It was an upper class preoccupation and historians believe it was about status, both vis-a-vis -vis one another and as a show for the lower classes. Male plantation owners were patriarchs, expected to exert firm control over their dependents, whether women, children, workers, or slaves, though in different ways, obviously. They were expected to project an upright character at all times, to appear strong, courageous, and capable of physically protecting their mini fiefdoms from whatever might happen. So these duels, where the point was to face the possibility of their own death with stoicism over any insult to their honor, were a way of showing that, a public show of that willingness, and a proof of their worth as leaders of society. When some of these men sought other and less potentially deadly ways of dealing with these kinds of issues, they risked serious damage to their own reputations and that of their family. And that loss of reputation carried heavy penalties in this honor-obsessed culture. You may wonder if these battles, just how deadly were they? Well, the rules stated that if both duelists got off a shot and missed, the duel could be called off at that point. But when too many duels went in this way, people would start grousing. You can't prove that you're willing to face down death if no one ever dies. And keeping in mind that a lot of these duels were fought by young men with something to prove. The obvious downside here is an unnecessary loss of life for those young men and often profound guilt for the survivor who had killed someone, someone who might well have been their friend previously, over an insult. This guilt sometimes led to suicide. And this was, to underscore the point, an upper-class thing. If someone from a lower class was to challenge you, it was expected that you would ignore that challenge, and there was no loss of face for that. In this way, they maintained the boundaries around their own social rank and honor. Lower classes were deprived of honor by definition. Upper-class men engaged the lower classes violently through their Minutemen or vigilance societies in the dark of night, or under the auspices of laws which functionally criminalized poverty. But that was a one-way street, right? Hey, so we're halfway through, and I know it's a lot. So, I, I really just want to get this out all in one go if I can, or in two, closely put together if I have to, because I don't really want to have this sitting on my to-do list, because, okay, I love history, I do, but this, this topic is, I don't know I love this topic so much. But at least, either way, I want to give you um, a brief intermission. A minute to stretch your legs, take a breath. I got a little of that antebellum southern culture here waiting for you to enjoy. And we'll be back to talk about women, white trash, and God. Won't that be fun? Bye! I wish I was in the land of cotton. Old times there are not forgotten. Look away, look away, look away, Dixieland. In Dixieland, where I was born, early on a frosty morning. Look away, look away, look away, Dixieland. And I wish I was in Dixie. Away, away, away 
down south in Dixie.